Wonderful. We'll start. So thank you very much. Um, this evening is being recorded again, so we don't expect you to take notes. Uh, but a warm welcome either to the VIPs in person in the lecture theatre and uh, to all the families joining us at home. So the reason we are doing this is our first talk or workshop like this for parents, um, simply because it's becoming such a common question. Parents really want to help their children, and we welcome the, the support of parents, and we need to work very closely together. Um, it comes on the back of a very successful revision day. So this is our first parents talk, and today was our first revision day. So Mr. Shaw will tell you more about that later. Um, it's important tonight that we are exploring what works for the pupils, what works best for them. So we'll be sharing hints, tips, suggestions. There might be some things that are new. There might be some things you've heard before. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that as everything we do at Chip Lake is about the individual, revision and exam success is, is the same. What works for one pupil might not work for another pupil. So hopefully, and amongst all the information this evening, there'll be something that you can confidently take home. We would thought about originally um, an evening for year 11 parents only, those pupils experiencing public exams for the first time. But actually, of course, due to the events of the last two years, year 13 pupils will not have sat an exam either. So we wanted to extend it to all pupils, years 11 and 13. So again, we hope there's something for you all this evening. So a brief overview of the evening. Um, we'll explore the role of the parent. We'll look at revision in a little bit more detail, again, echoing many of the, the messages that the pupils will have received today. Um, We'll show you the resources that the pupils have access to, and of course, which you have access to. Um, we'll look at some of the research, what some of the research says, because in teaching now, we are led more and more by educational research, and uh, where there's a good reason for do some, doing something, we will adopt it. We'll also look at tough love, possibly the hardest part of your role as, as a parent. There will be a point where you'll need to be the bad guy. Um, and I say this as a parent of a teenager as well, so I'm dreading that day when his exams come. And we'll look at the big day itself, exam excitement. We won't use anxiety or nerves, exam excitement and how to perform and peak performance on the day. Um, before I continue, I'm not sure if they're visible on the camera, but I am joined tonight by my two wonderful colleagues, Mr. Sam Shaw and Mrs. Emma Farrell. And um, so Mrs. Farrell works closely with Year 13 in her role as head of sixth form. And Miss Shaw uh, has a whole school role for, for learning at the college, but will work closely with Year 11. And you'll hear more from them uh, shortly. So I'll take the first part, role of the parent. So we want to stress that it's very much a team effort and we welcome the chance to work closely with you. I hope that's clear. It's always been the case at Ship Blake, but particularly in the exam years. Success with uh, the pupils' exams, it rests largely on all of us working closely together. Pupil, parent and, and school, of course. One of your main roles will be to be a calming influence, a listener. Um, I know that you're very experienced dealing with teenagers, but sometimes you just need to let them, let them express their anxieties, their frustrations, their, their feelings. And it's your, one of your key roles is to be that calming influence. It's important, of course, you want to help them with their academic work, but it's important that there isn't another teacher in the equation. They'll be getting nagged enough by us about prep and work and target grades. So it's important that there's some balance in this relationship, that they don't get that from both of us. That's probably where you come in, to be that calming influence. And it's important above all else that long after they've left Chip Lake, that you protect your relationship. It'll be an emotional year, few months, few weeks, few days, and they'll run up to an exam. But it's important to have the bigger picture in mind. And above all else, you need to protect your relationship with your children. Um, and your role is many and varied. Cheerleader, counsellor, coach, motivator, chef, project manager, the list will go on. But above all else, you're on their side. You're on your children's side and they know they need to come to you uh, for that calming influence. Of course, they can approach us for that as well. And particularly if pupils board, we are all of these things to them as well, of course. But above uh, at the end of the day, I'm sorry, you are their parent and that relationship is, is, is very important. Um, it's important that you ask the pupils individually how you can support them. 
individual pupils will have different needs. Uh, some pupils might like you to, to help them plan their revision, particularly year 11, if they've not done it before. Um, and the pupils in year 13 might just like you to chat through with them how things are going, um, how their preparation is going. Um, it's important also to take an active interest. And a great way of doing this is testing testing the pupils. Uh, we uh, explored flashcards today. So that is an obvious way that you can you can engage with pupils. Carry on with this list. It's important to praise the effort above, above all else. If a pupil is working really hard on their revision, it's important that you recognize that. I can see you worked really hard this half term or this evening. You've, you put the hours in. I'm really proud of you. Well done. Irrespective of you know the, the outcome or the next test, it's important that you praise the effort. That's what you need to see at the weekends and at home. It's important to keep perspective as well. The big why. It might be to come back in year 12 with us. Hopefully it might be to get a place at their preferred university but at some point um, normal life will return I put it on there this exam stress will be over so it's important to keep that perspective um, and another important role of the parent is to provide that working environment it's important they have a have a have a have a desk space preferably in their own room um, away from the busyness of maybe the kitchen table where other family members could come and distract them but at the same time it's important that desk doesn't also have an Xbox on it for example, it's important to provide a really positive working environment for them. And in some households, I know that mirrors and backs of doors will be filled with post-it notes and flashcards and mind maps. So it's important to consider if there's a, a space in your house that will uh, serve a similar purpose. But you need to give some consideration to that. And again, ask the pupils. The diagram you can see there is something I mentioned earlier. Um, but a key part I didn't mention is also the students need to buy into this as well. So I think if they can see us working closely together with their best interests at heart, uh, then hopefully they will buy into the process as well. Because at the end of the day, we're in this room on this meet because we want the best outcomes for all of our pupils, your children, of course. Enough from me for now. I'm delighted to hand over to Mr. Shaw, who will explore in a bit more detail some revision strategies. So I'll just hand the microphone over. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Thank you very much. What are all? Uh, nice to meet you. So I'm, I'm Mr. Shaw, so I'm responsible for learning and enrichment. Actually, being responsible for learning seems like a, a frightfully large task. Uh, but I'm also a head of psychology. So the opportunity to talk about memory and revision and things that actually enhance your memory of things it is something that I feel quite passionately about. Um, and one of the things linked to this is perception. So if I draw your attention to this graph, if I show you the graph on the right to begin with, so uh, the right, we can see that these are the things that pupils thought worked best for them. So they liked reading, 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 and reading. In second place, they put reading, 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 and testing. In last place, they put reading, testing, testing, and testing. And this was their perception of which of those techniques worked best for them. So they actually rated how much they enjoyed the revision. So there are actually three groups here. One group only had reading, one group had a mix, and one group mainly had testing. And they had to rate how useful they found the session. And it is the polar opposite to the way that the results worked. The group that only read did worse. The group that had the most testing did best. And there's a real thing here about what students sometimes perceive works well for them doesn't. And in fact, they're doing it because it's comfortable. And it's about identifying what strategies actually work to build memories, because that's the purpose of revision. So I've broken revision strategies down into four main areas that you may find uh, too useful to support with. And the first is engaging with notes. And I'm going to run through a couple of methods that you can do that. The Cornell system, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I didn't find it out until after my studies, and I'm hugely disappointed. Um, there's the mind mapping system. Um, we also have retrieval practice, and this is how we actually bring stuff back to mind. And we're going to look at uh, free recall and cue cards there. And then the adaptive learning techniques, such as GCSE Pod and Seneca, which are programs that we use, which I'll demonstrate to you. So the first is about engaging with your notes. So as I said, students like things that are really passive, but they just don't work. Reading your notes has this thing called the effect of familiarity, okay? And I'll explain that in a moment. So what the Cornell Note system does, it divides your page into three sections. You have a main section on the right where you take your notes in a lesson. You have a section on the right for cues, important information, questions that you might want to ask, and you have a summary at the bottom. So in your lessons or when you're revising from a textbook, a presentation, uh, the internet, a video, you take your notes as normal in that section on the right. 
But then when you finish your note taking session, you read back over them, the bit that they'll actually perhaps like doing, and then you ask questions about that um, information. You point out some of the more important elements. You go, well, what are the three most important things you write in that column? And it demonstrates and actually makes them engage with the notes that they've already taken, recontextualize them, analyze them, as well as taking the notes. And then at the bottom, there's a summary. How do you sum up this page of notes in one sentence? So this, what's so good about this strategy is that it acts as both their initial note-taking system and the revision built-in. So that's one method they could use. They could also use mind maps. Um, mind maps are a, quite a slow process, but they're fantastic. Uh, we've had part of revision day today here. We've had someone in, and we've all learned. So uh, Mrs. Farrell learned everything about Muhammad Ali. Uh, when was Muhammad Ali born? 1942. There we go. When was Leonardo da Vinci born? 1542. Um, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Jones, I didn't know you were in that <laughs> session. <laughs> On what day? April 15th. Correct. Um, all this we learned in one five minute session through looking at a mind map. And the mind map involves taking the notes you already have and then dividing it into subsections. So for, in that particular example, it was early life. Um, and then you have a branch and a picture demonstrating each of those. So what you're doing is you're converting those notes. You're converting that dense text from your textbook presentation into cues that shape out that topic. So you just see the cue and that reminds you of the, the learning that goes with it. The reason that this is revision is because you're taking, you're converting it from one format to another and that's what builds memories. Okay, I always uh, liken your memories to taking a walk in the woods. You've got really good built National Trust Park walks that you can follow and there are little spinnies that come off it. Those spinnies are the things you've learned that day and unless you walk down them again and again and again, you're never gonna find them again. And this is what mind maps do. They make you walk down that route with heavier shoes, if you like. Then there's recall and recognition. So this is something I think we're all guilty of. Um, and the reason people like reading is because when they read, they recognize. So a lot of people said to me today that when I gave them a list of things and asked them to rate how much they know them, they say, well, I say here that I don't know it, sir. But if I were to look at it in a textbook, I'd remember it all. And I go, yes, but you didn't without the textbook, did you? That's that's the thing. So when you read something, you go, oh, I know that. Yeah, I, I vividly remember Mrs. Farrell telling me that. I like, but if I were to say, what did Miss Farrell say to you three weeks ago? You wouldn't remember it without those cues available. Free recall involves you sitting down initially with nothing, nothing but the scary blank page. And you put your topic in the middle, astrophysics. I don't think we cover astrophysics. Uh, you put your topic in the middle and then you add everything you can until you can add no more. And then you have five minutes with your notes. You can't write anything then. You have five minutes to examine your notes, examine what it is you don't know, and then put it away, and then see if you can remember it there. This does two things. One, it builds those connections I talked about, but two, it highlights what we don't know. It highlights the areas that we need to revise, we need to focus on. Uh, an analogy for this one is, and I'm sure that you might experience this, Mr. Jones, as a music teacher, when people are learning a new piece of music, fur elise, for example, da 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 da, and they get this a bit they can't do. Okay, da 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 da, okay, then they might that bit up, da 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 da, well, they're fantastic at those four notes, but it's the next five that they can't play. And this is what free Roy call does. It means you stop polishing your banisters and you focus on the things that you really need to tackle. Um, another strategy uh, for involving recall practice is cue cards. Making the cue cards is a form of converting information um, similar to mind maps, and, and that will be helpful. Sometimes making cue cards isn't. If you're just kind of regurgitating the knowledge, copying it from a book onto a, a card, that's not necessarily useful. And fortunately, there are fantastic programs like Quizlet online where you can download pre-made flashcards. But this is the spaced retrieval method. This is where you have three boxes. You have an everyday box, you have a, a Tuesday and um, a Thursday box, and you have a Friday box. So every day you take a handful of cards. Uh, the ones you get right, um, you can put all the way at the end. The ones that you got wrong have to go back into the everyday box and so what happens is as you go through you end up doing the questions you find hardest every single day the questions you find easiest once a week and the questions you sort of get in the middle end up in the middle okay and this means that as you move through you're only focusing on those elements that you find hardest okay you will revisit in a spaced way the things that you you don't so you don't become overconfident but this is a really good way of actually using the flashcards once you've made them 
And in terms of the adaptive, lo uh, adaptive learning programs, we subscribe to GCSE pod, which would be really useful for year 11s. This breaks down every single topic on the specifications that they study. It's exactly tailored to the exact topics that they study. And it breaks down every single topic into a three minute video, no longer than three minutes, okay, because that's the ideal attention span, and some are, are quite a bit shorter than that. And there's quite a lot of evidence that watching these videos and answering the associated self-marking quizzes um, allow you to really test your progress, and those students that spend more time, actually, I very rarely say this, more time watching videos end up doing better. Um, it really is a fantastic program. And I've put uh, a link, which I'll we'll send in these presentations, GCSE pod have done a fantastic amount to engage parents. Um, so this uh, website here um, for GCSE pod tells you in a webinar how to use it. It tells you how you can track their progress, uh, how the whole program works, the videos, and they also put on loads of webinars um, to engage with you and worksheets here. For example, how do I help my child in English? How do I help my child uh, to build a revision plan? How do I support them through their GCSEs? It really is a fantastic resource. Uh, similarly, um, Seneca, which is a completely free online platform which breaks down the um, exam questions from the A-level specifications uh, into kind of reading and comprehension content. What's really good about Seneca is that it has adaptive learning. If you get a question right, it's going to let you move on. If you struggle, it's going to find a way in that same session to ask you that question again. And you can see how many hours have been spent and how many questions asked. Every now and then a, a pupil comes to tell me I spent 100 hours on a uh, on Seneca. And I go, yeah, you, you've answered 12 questions. So you can't <laughs> leave it on in the background, it doesn't count. Um, and this also includes uh, a huge amount of information um, and how you can actually sign up to the same group that um, your children are in and you can track their progress and, and help set them tasks on there. Ooh, wrong click. So in terms of uh, revision timetables, this old adage, um, it can be really useful if it is flexible. And as part of revision day today, every pupil has started making um, a revision timetable. And this is on their Google Classrooms, so you can see those. The advice that they've been given is to put in all of the things that they already do. So the, um, their prep time, their sports activities, the things that they do with a weekend, if they have a job, put all of those in. And then put in some realistic time for breaks. OK, be flexible okay, and be realistic. If you have a free day and say, well, I'm going to do eight hours of revision, that's really unlikely. Um, you are probably not going to stick to that. And so having that flexibility built in that you can change things is much more useful. Thinking sort of two 25 minute sessions, allowing you to take a break. And a really good piece of advice is the two minute rule. Just open your books and set yourself the task of two minutes. And you know it, you will have done 15. It's really useful just to, to break the back of it by having a go. And so revision timetables that have breaks that are realistic, um, that help them set a routine. What's really useful as well, if, if this is used in combination with the other techniques I've talked about, um, and every pupil today has been given the revision content and they've been asked to traffic light it, what do you know well, what are you less confident in, and, and what do you need to spend more time on? And, and don't, don't split your time evenly. Um, if you really struggle with physics, revise physics more than the subject that you know really well. Um, and so I've put a guide on here. Uh, so if you click on this image, it takes you to the, the ones that the students have created with all of the advice they've got up until these November assessments, but then the same template can be used going forward. It's also worth planning in a, around the actual exams um, and making sure you not plan to revise maths after both the exams are finished um, and making sure that you know this is, this is timed and it's realistic. And particularly in the idea of being realistic, is how uh, a kind of linking to the role of the parent. One thing to be wary of is lying to ourselves. Um, sometimes uh, someone will go, I've done an hour's revision today. You go, have you? Because our lessons are only 50 minutes long, so you're already, you've already added 10 minutes. You go, okay, right, well, well I arrived. Like, did you arrive on time? I might have been a minute late. Okay, okay. And how long did it take you to get all your stuff out? Oh, about five minutes. How long did it take you to check your emails before you started? And maybe five again. And did you treat yourself after you've done your emails just to watch a quick video? Yeah, okay. So you did 20 minutes of revision actually in that hour, didn't you? And, and this happens so much and we can be guilty of this as well. So it's actually about spotting and you hear done an hour's revision, plot it out how much was actually achieved in that time. And that's why two 25 minute sessions with the task of only actually getting two minutes done um, can be really effective in getting started.
And so really proud of revision day to day. And this is what uh, your sons and daughters will have covered, a five step revision plan, starting with getting started. So they've all had a complete way of organizing their folders was provided by teachers. A revision list was provided by teachers with a traffic list system. And they uh, created a um, timetable. So they managed this timetable, um, and which is still a work in progress. Many of them didn't have a chance to finish it. And that's something they all know that they need to finish. And you'll be able to see on their Google Classrooms. Finding out what they don't know. So they learned both of these strategies about traffic lighting all of the topics, as well as creating a free recall mind map. Many of them found that really useful. Actually revising, so they learned the techniques of Cornell notes, they learned the techniques of mind mapping, uh, they learned space retrieval, and they also learned that statistic about not just rereading and highlighting. And then they had some practice quizzes at the end of the day, an opportunity to test and to see how they did in those tests. These were self-assessing tests that gave you a score at the end, um, and GCSE, Pod, and Seneca. So this is our five-step revision plan. And in between all this, we had an external speaker. So if your um, son or daughter was in year 11 or 13, well, which they will have been for this session for 11 and 13 parents, they will have had something on exams anxiety and about managing stress and resilience, actually, and phrasing it. So they will have all covered um, some strategies there. Um, so. That's, uh, that's what we covered in revision day. And the, the structure that supported all of this is the Ship Lake Learning uh, website. Um, so this is available on the pupil portal. And this is where we keep everything learning and everything um, revision for the pupils. And you can see, if I click on it, it should take me there that it's broken into GCSE pod, for example, is included. Uh, they have a home page which tells them how to get revising. In terms of all of the subjects, that has linked to the exam boards, the specification, where they can find past papers, useful links and revision guides that the teachers have set out. And many teachers have actually put in some of their own created um, revision guides. So if I go to history, for example, uh, they've broken down. So if we were to click um, GCSE history, we can see that we've got everything that comes up in all of the different papers broken down, useful links, and built-in revision guides on every topic that they cover. Um, we have the exam timetables. We have the timetable for academic clinics. This is the revision day, um, revision checklist, and all of the links that they could want. And everything is here available for them on their pupil portal as the one sort of stop shop to find everything they need to do for this exams. And we update it for every series of exams. Um, so you've listened to my dulcet tones for uh, long enough. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will pass back over to Mr. Jones. And my thanks to Mr. Shaw for his work with the heads of department today who've, who've worked incredibly hard to provide an enormous, enormous number of resources for pupils and, of course, parents. Um, I'm briefly going to cover some of the main uh, research topics. There's a brilliant book. I brought it with me, but I'm not going to dash over. But it's the science of learning. It's a digest of all the best educational research. And I thought that there were... Oh, it's going to be handed to me. Look at that. That's wonderful. So this one. So um, the three of us went to the Eton Teaching and Learning Summit in the summer. We were uh, pleased to be able to take this book away with us. And it's informed lots of our thinking on what we're doing this year as well. But these are the five uh, findings of the five areas of research I'd like to focus on. Parents' views on failure, parental praise, phones and sleep, breakfast, parents and grades. So one slide per research paper. So parents' views can affect their children's mindset. Parents can view failure as either enhancing and enhancing a positive experience or debilitating. So it's, it's, it's in your power how you approach this and you will have a direct influence on how your children see this. Parents who viewed failure as enhancing or as a positive are more likely to have a child with a growth mindset. You've probably heard a lot about this phrase in recent years. It's had quite a negative press as well. Some people have reacted to it. But actually, fundamentally, it's about the fact that a pupil um, has the belief that they can develop their intelligence. That's really important rather than being fixed, a fixed mindset where they believe that they're no good at maths. A growth mindset will tell them, actually, I'm not good at quadratic equations, but with practice, I can get better. So that growth mindset is what we're looking to instill in, in, in the pupils. So the takeaway for parents is that you we need to model and help children view failure as enhancing a positive experience, a chance to learn lessons. Lesson number one. Number two, parental praise. So there are two types of praise. There's process praise, as in, well done, you must have worked very hard for that assessment, versus person praise. Good boy, you're so clever. 
probably heard both. Uh, you probably received both types of praise yourselves. Um, luckily for the boys in year 11, boys are far more likely to hear this process praise, actually. So that's a good thing. And again, process praise develops a growth mindset. They get into the habits of working hard and they can see that hard work comes to fruition further down the line in, in their test results. That's one of the reasons why we celebrate engagement with learning on our reports at Chip Lake. Important during the toddler years. Um, it's a bit late now, but it was formed in between the ages of two and four. Um, uh, the pupils' uh, view of this, when their motivation is set, when they, when, when they start to, to realize what, it, what inspires them. However, even though they're teenagers, we can still continue to use and model the process praise. That's why I mentioned be careful with praise earlier. It's the effort that we're praising. Number three, phones and sleep. I know Mrs. Farrell will touch upon this in a moment with the tough love section, but seven to nine hours sleep, it's essential to the learning process. Some of you may have read that wonderful book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. I know both Mrs. Farrell and I have read it. You may have seen on our uh, email signatures, we share the books we read. And there is a chapter devoted to, to, to learning on there. Even last week in the news, I'm sure it was on the BBC website, if you go to bed between 10 and 11, you are far less likely to experience um, heart problems, I'm sure. Please don't quote me on that. But there's even now there's, there's a link for, for adults. But it's essential to the learning process for the brain to filter and to store and to transfer things to long-term memory. So seven to nine hours is essential. We all know blue light from devices emitted by devices uh, reduces melatonin, uh, the production of the sleep hormones, tells your body you need to sleep. Um, and being on a device for two hours before bedtime uh, results in a 20% reduction in melatonin being released, which therefore affects the quality of the sleep. But also, activity on, you, on the phone is just as important. Pupils might be building a playlist or listening to a very calming piece of music on YouTube but they're more likely to be engaged with social media, um, having a look at what their friends are doing, responding to messages, Snapchat, whatever it is at, at the moment. And that in itself increases their anxiety, which therefore leads to a, a reduction in quality sleep. So the activity on phones and devices is also as important. Therefore, the takeaway for parents is enforce strict limits on the use of devices before bed. And that's something that will be difficult to enforce, I know. I, I know, I'm, I'm getting there. My children are much younger than exam years, but I know we're ready to battle. Four, four or five, eating breakfast. So eating breakfast reduces the natural decline in, in attention and memory throughout the morning. Um, in con terms of concentration levels, they will naturally decline, but this decline will be reduced by 65%. <laughs> in terms of memory recall, there'll be a plus five um, improvement in memory recall versus a 27% reduction in your ability to remember stuff if you had a sugary drink for breakfast. That's quite alarming when I read that. Um, and obviously, obviously alertness is maintained throughout the morning. There's not that, that crash if you had a sugary drink or donut on the bus coming to school. And the quote there, nothing, nothing new, I'm sure. Breakfast has a positive effect on cognitive function. So message for us is uh, reinforce the importance of breakfast not an issue for boarders of course they enjoy their full English every single day but it might become an issue at the weekends in holidays in exam season and the last one parents and grades so this is the biggest one it's a summary of 37 studies separate studies so these are the big takeaways for for parents the importance of having high academic expectations has the biggest impact. And that's simply not putting pressure on them to achieve something that's not achievable or impossible, but doing their very best, personal bests. Again, that's why we reinforce that at Chip Lake. The second biggest takeaway is regular communication with, with your children. Just inquiring, what prep do you have? Is there anything I can help you with? Can I get you a snack for when it's your break time? How was the test today? I hope it went well. You worked really hard. Good reading habits. It's never too late to start these. And that leads to reading fitness. Um, there's a stat that you might not be able to see it, but just 20 minutes reading a day will expose pupils to 1.8 million words a year. And they are likely, far more likely, to achieve in the top 10% of any tests in their class. That's just 20 minutes reading a day. And reading fitness can be, can be improved upon like any fitness. And the final one for parents is 
there are clear rules around study and leisure time at home. So supervising, and interestingly, sorry, supervising homework, sitting there with them, doing, doing homework with your children had less of an impact than you might think. But it's just having those clear boundaries. Now is, it's, it's leisure time. This is work time. And then the biggest takeaway, <laughs> continue to, to promote the above. Thank you. Really interesting section coming up. And I'll hand over to Mrs. Farrell. Hello, everybody. So lovely to see you all virtually and in person. So this is probably one of the more challenging parts. It's all well and good us giving you all of these brilliant things that you can do. But when we're trying to maintain our positive relationships with the children, um, it becomes more challenging to get those routines and habits that they are not um, predisposed to uh, be happy about. So a little bit of a uh, chat about these uh, areas that we need to have a little bit of tough love around um, and, and some advice and sort of research around why it's really, really important. Um, so the first couple of things, so TV, music and phones sort of all come together in this, you know, device band. Um, and the reason that it's really, really important that um, the students, when they're studying, are not um, engaging with these while they're working is because of their cognitive load. Basically, what is can fit in their brain at any one time, any one task. And there are three elements to this. So we've got the intrinsic load, which is the information in front of them that they are learning. Um, in general. The second part, was, which is the extraneous load, which is everything else around that, how the information is um, formatted, how everything else that's in the room around the student. And this is the bit that, um, that you can help us with. The intrinsic load is what we, we provide them with. We tell them this is what they need to learn. Um, extraneous load, we can also manage that in how we present it to them. But the environment in which they're learning it and the environment in which they're studying is really important and something that you can help them with. And then we've got the germane load, which is you know the important stuff. How do they know which bit is important? And again, that's down to us as teachers to make that really clear. Um, but as I said, the, the extraneous load is what you what you can help us with. Um, so the adolescent brain has got a lower capacity for working memory. They are not as good as us as, as adults as retaining that information and, and uh, retaining more information. And the reason being, uh, there are a couple of different reasons. One of the main reasons is they don't have the life experience in order to understand which bit of information they need. So they can't work out what that germane load is, which bit is important. Um, so we need to try and address all of the other areas to help them with that. Um, so even the mere presence of a phone has been proven to cause a 20% decrease in performance in study and in examinations. So not even looking at the phone, just having it there and having that, you know, in the corner of your eye, knowing what's on there, what's contained within that is decreasing performance and before they even pick it up and, and open it up. Um, Listening to music reduces productivity by 10%, according to some studies. Um, and we were discussing this just before, um, before you all arrived. Every single one of the students in my tutor group today when I was working with them said, oh, miss, can we put our headphones in? I work so much better when I'm listening to music. Some of us might believe that we do that as well, but there's absolutely zero research to, that proves this to be true, especially music with words, because our brain, our cognitive load, can't manage all of that information. We're trying to take this in, we're trying to learn what's in front of us, this content. We can't have extra stuff around us um, if we want to work effectively. So we need to work together, and, and when um, the students are working at home with you in their home environment, we need as much help from you as possible to remove all of that extra extra load um, so there's a little bit of a link in the in the slides here I'll not go through all of these but some really key reasons why um, having your phone away when studying is really really important um, nothing completely brand new to us here we know this it lowers the concentration the FOMO elements just having it there what am I missing I don't I want to grab it um, I want it I want to get that it reduces memory so you can't concentrate on those two things at once and then linked to what Mr. Jones was saying about warping view of reality. Oh, Johnny has been revising for, you know, six hours today. Johnny hasn't been revising for six hours today. Instagram says that he has, but he probably hasn't. Um, and that in, in turn improve, uh, increases stress and anxiety. And as we've just discussed, impact sleep. So it is one of the single most important things we think as a school. That's why we don't have phones in the school. They're not permitted here. Um, and during that study period at home, if you could continue that with your children, that would be absolutely fantastic, just getting into those really good habits and not having the phone anywhere near that study area. 
Um, so what you can do to help with this as well is, as Mr. Jones has said, that quiet study space without distractions. It's actually quite hard when they're in the room. You think that's quiet, you think that's peaceful, but actually that's where all the really super distracting stuff is for them. That's where, uh, you know, their Xbox is. It might be where they've got a TV in there. They might have posters on the wall or whatever it might be that's, that takes I mean, you know, adds that extraneous load. So where possible, try and create create a space for them that is as, you know, peaceful, calm, and less distracting as possible. And encouraging a tidy and organized workspace, which I know will make everyone happy anyway, having a tidy room and a bed made and such like, but anything that can that can help with that. Um, we spent the time today, as Mr. Shaw said, working on a revision timetable with them. Um, so please take a look at it and review it with them. You will then know when they are studying. So we can you can have that conversation, you know, between half seven and half eight tonight, you're doing your study. So you'll have, I'll have your phone during that. It's one hour and get into that habit of using the revision timetable as a, as a way of starting that conversation and promoting those good habits. And as well as that, enforce breaks, you know, again, with the cognitive load, we, we need to have some breaks in there. They're not going to be able to work for three hours solid. Um, so if they are taking a break um, or if there's a break in that schedule, do enforce it. It's a good thing to enforce as aside from the phones. Um, but have a time limit because as we all know, we were talking about it today in our tutor group. You pick up your phone and you say, oh, I'll just look on Instagram for two minutes, next minutes, 45 minutes later. And where has that time gone? We do it and they certainly will do it. So put a time limit, get them to put a little timer on their phone or you put a little timer on for them and say, right, off we go, phone back off them and, and away they go back to their studying. Um, Next thing is sleep. We've we've covered this already. It is so unbelievably important in so many areas for our, for our young people. Absolutely key to the consolidation of memory. We've talked about skills to develop memory, but actually the brain does so much work um, when when we're sleeping so that our memory can be consolidated. Um, so it's absolutely vital that that when they are studying and trying to remember all of this information, that that they get the, our seven to nine hours sleep a night. We know this is vital for op optimal attention and efficient learning. If we're tired, if we're sleepy, we are not going to be paying attention as as much as we could be if we had our full night's sleep. And another thing that's really important around these exam time, excuse me, <coughs> is actually it's a very emo emotional time. It's stressful and. Teenage lives are very emotional, and there's lots of things going on. And actually, we can do all of these things, and then we can have a we can have a breakup, we can have a falling out with a friend, we can have something going on at home, and um, that actually, you know, can turn the whole thing upside down. But if they have enough sleep, they can manage their emotions um, more easily. And um, so, sleep is absolutely key to all of these areas. So, again, from your perspective, please. Again, use your revision timetable to create a regular bedtime and sleep routines. And if they can get that embedded, oh my word, the positive impact it will have on their studying is unbelievable. Um, remove their devices a couple of hours beforehand. We've looked at the stats. So take them away from them. We do it here in school. If needs be, you know, be brutal. Disable that Wi-Fi so they can't get on Netflix when they're lying in bed. I don't know how easy that's going to be or how well that will go down with the rest of the family. But um, And really, really... I can't stress it enough, please protect that sleep time. They will sometimes want to stay awake late into the night. They'll be stressed about getting coursework deadlines, about um, revising tests, but quite frankly, none of that will matter uh, and none of the quality of that will be any good if they don't get their sleep. So make it a pri priority and protect it for them, please. Comparison. So a little bit of... <laughs> Another challenging thing about being a being a teenager, being an adolescent in school, is that you know a lot of what um, your behaviour and a lot of your decisions and a lot of your thought processes are around what everyone else is doing. Um, so assessment results day to day, um, conversations with students in school, social media, of course, always feed into a picture of what other people are doing and what they're achieving. Um, and as is normal human behavior, we all do it. Um, we do compare ourselves to other people, but it is really becomes detrimental to our young people when they are looking at people who seem to be achieving things or someone is having more or doing better. Um, that's when it comes really detrimental to this exam, um, exam situation. So 
if they're not achieving what they perceive other people to be achieving, starts to create those feelings of not being good enough, not being intelligent enough, and, and actually can start to become really, really demotivational. So in order to help, we've talked about this, we are a personal best school, so we are very much about what, what that student is, individual student is achieving in relation to their own goals, into their own abilities, and, and really promoting that and celebrating that. So we ask that, that you do the same, you know, it is a personal best about your own personal progress. Um, we want... <clears throat> We want them to compare themselves to themselves. Where were you this time last year? Where were you this time last half term? And that's what we promote. And if you could do the same at home, that would be really, really brilliant. Um, it's sometimes really easy to compare your child to others. Maybe when they're younger and they're developing and they're growing, but actually, oh, uh, oh I saw Johnny. Oh, that's great. Johnny Johnny was revising last all weekend when, when you were out with your friends. Not necessarily being... Uh, insulting or spiteful towards them and but actually just that comparison automatically in their brain makes them think I'm not as good as Johnny um, so try and avoid that where possible and reframe the goal not be the best be your best be your best and they will know what that is and in order to do that you can work with them to set personal goals so that they can achieve um, in a way that is suitable to them and is and we can celebrate that progress not the end result the, how did they get there we talked about celebrating that element of hard work and and continually doing that right from now that would be fantastic so then we come to uh, the big day um, and actually in the lead up to the big day um, so a couple of things for you to sort of think about and be aware of as a parent so being aware of your own anxiety they're not your exams although it may feel even more stressful than when you did your exams because you want them to do so well and you know how well they can do um but be really aware of that and i'm just going to go through each of these um, um as we go through so the more stressed you are the less likely your child is to speak to you about why they're worried because they're lovely and they don't want to worry you anymore so they can see your stress so they don't want to come and say i don't really know how to do this or you know how can i do this so try and you know look after yourselves in the lead up to these exams as well as looking after them because it will help the relationship and it will help them immensely and create that calm atmosphere you may not feel it inside feel as calm as you possibly can and create that and and if work isn't going well or you feel like they haven't studied to the very best of their ability it's not because they don't want to achieve everyone wants to do their best it's there's probably something else at play there they might be just panicking they might have just hit that wall um it's not so sort of blame and this creation of an atmosphere of fear of going, no, I have, I have to do it because, you know, my mum taught me. Try and your very best to ask questions. What's going on? I see you haven't quite managed to finish that maths revision you had planned to do. What's going on? Rather, you know, than going in all guns blazing. Um, and we chatted about, well, Mr. Jones mentioned this. So it's kind of reframing some of the language is just really, really helpful. Um, so that preparation time, that lead up to the examinations and on the day itself, Again, you're going to be feeling super stressed, but rather than saying, gosh, you must be so nervous going into this exam. Gosh, it's nerve wracking. I remember when I did my maths GCSE, I was so nervous. And actually, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then they start feeling really nervous. So let's reframe that a little bit. Just change the language around and say, gosh, you must be so excited to actually finally get to show all of the hard work that you've done. Um, make, you must be so excited to be finished with maths forever and never see it again. So yeah, just reframe that. <laughs> I've got, you know, it's, yeah, it's... <laughs> um, so yeah, just reframe it a little bit in the lead up to the exam and on the day um, in a more positive, positive spin. And then this really wonderful um, strategy, which um, which we read about um, with in dealing with anxiety uh, in you know in life, not just around exams. You know, there's going to be so many what ifs. A, a year eleven students going into year year twelve. What if I don't get the grades to do the courses I want to do? Year thirteen students going into university. What if I don't get into the university I want to get to? What if I don't get the grades? What if what if what if? And it's all of this, you know, not sometimes irrational, um, but, but sometimes. Um, but but inevitable fear about the future with no evidence to back up that they're not going to achieve what they want to achieve. So again, reframing that and and just asking the question, so what? Okay, what if you don't get the, you know, your seven in English? So what? 
then you'll do this this and this and it just sort of restores the balance a little bit so what what if you know i flunk every single one of my gcse's and i freak out on the exam and i, I can't complete them and I'm, I'm sitting there staring at a blank page so what then we'll make a plan we'll retake your english and maths next year and we'll look at a different plan there's always we know there's you know so many different pathways so it's just reframing that a little bit. It just removes the extremes a little bit <clears throat> of this, oh my goodness, the world will end because it is their whole world at the minute. Um, takes the, some of the fears and the worries away a little bit. Um, so, so trying that if you find um, one of those dire moments where they're having an absolute meltdown, this can be quite beneficial. Um, and then a little bit about simulation and rehearsal. So the more opportunities we can give them to practice, um, practice the papers, which we do in school here, they've got numerous practice papers on that revision site Mr Shaw showed you um, so, um, rehearsing the, rehearsing the questions rehearsing subjects revising and simulation so we've got loads of opportunities in school for them to do that and um, with their mock exams coming up with our 11s and 13s their mocks will be taking place in the sports hall where they will be doing their actual real exams so they can visualize themselves in there in a, in a positive way and, and sort of with a slightly lower stakes um, environment um, but from from your point of view just in the build up to this big day and um, encourage the practice papers in a controlled environment in a timed environment that often can cause um, most of the anxieties you know what if I don't have enough time and I can still writing and um, so the more rehearsal the more we simulate this the process the more familiar it will be the more it will reduce the stress as they move into the actual real thing so I hope that's been been helpful and we would like to welcome any questions. So huge thanks to those who sent through questions in advance. You may remember on the Google form, uh, we invited any particular topics. I do hope we've covered many of them tonight or most of them. Um, if there are any questions either in real life in the lecture theatre or, or if you're able to type them, if you're on the meet, we'd be delighted to, to answer any. I've got one. If they, I don't know if it plus A, but I know it's um, GCSEs. The syllabus is going to be given in advance because they're, they're kind of homing down on what's entailed in the exams. Is that included on your... That's a really good question. Or? Would you mind if I just repeated it for the benefit <laughs> yeah, of everybody? Sorry. So the question we've, we've had from Mr Chambers in the lecture theatre is uh, where there have been syllabus reductions to account for, for COVID disruptions. Will that be reflected on, on the website? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, heads of department and our exams officer keeping a close eye on this. Many subjects have confirmed that there will be a reduction in the material this year. There will be adaptations and uh, we, we'll, we'll absolutely make sure that that is, is reflected. Yeah, I understand it's around 7th of February is number, okay. the number out of my head. And yes, like specifically GCSE pod, I would be amazed if GCSE pod don't tailor their um, their content to the exam. So in previous years, they have gone, sorry, in previous years, they'll say, I, they'll probably have um, summer 22 exams and it will break down the content for each of the subjects um, like that. If they don't, I'd be hugely, hugely surprised. Thank you. But some subjects have already confirmed or some exam boards have already <laughs> confirmed the reduction. With this coursework, for example, uh, music, DT, art, they'll, they'll be required to produce fewer pieces. But good question. Thank you. So is there still a chance that in February, in February the 7th, <coughs> they're going to say they're not doing exams? Absolutely not. No, I think it's the, the, the content. Absolutely. So you will have seen in the press last week that they, they uh, the, the government has, has announced they fully intend for exams to take place, um, and that's what they're still working towards. But the specification may be reduced to a, accommodate, but the exams are still going ahead at the moment. Can you go over how to access the learning website? Again? Absolutely. So learning access learning websites so is via the pupil portal, um, but there must be a way that we can share that link on the parent portal as well. We'll include a link in this presentation when we share it, uh, but it's a good question, thank you. And it's quite a new creation of ours, so we'll make sure that it's accessible um, somewhere on the ISAMS parent portal. Thank you. 
I saw there'd be some tricky questions I could pass to my colleagues, but uh, <laughs> well, it hasn't ever. Thank you very much. I'm really conscious that you've listened for a long time. I sincerely hope that's been useful. It's the first time we've done this. The intention is to be uh, as, 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 as open to working with parents as possible and to show you all the wonderful resources that are there. I'm hugely grateful to my colleagues, Mr. Shaw, Mrs. Farrell, for their input tonight. I'm also extremely grateful to Mrs. Green for her technical assistance throughout. Um, so massive thanks. Is there one last question? Question. Um, would the website also state the deadlines for graded projects? That's a GDP? great question, and absolutely, we are working with heads of department at them. Questions. Sorry, the, so the question was, will the website reflect uh, the coursework deadlines in various subjects? Absolutely. They'll also, so we'll make sure that those deadlines are on there, but also keep an eye on the Guardian weekly summaries that come from Google Classroom, because all of the coursework projects will be set as assignments. So on Friday evening, you'll be able to see on that email any forthcoming deadlines and teachers are likely in um, particularly in years 11 to 13 where the classes are smaller they're likely to be in direct communication with parents anyway about forthcoming coursework deadlines is there another question yes, coming in lovely comments saying thank you for all your hard work great session growth mindset so important thank you very much indeed <laughs> I'm really conscious uh, that we've that we're that we're going over. There are brownies left. I'm sorry we can't share them with you if you're at home. But uh, sincere thanks for joining us, and uh, hope that was useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.